the ICT event is great. 6,000 people. You know, more than 5 million people in Twitter follow the event. It's great, it's important because it's the Agora where everyone meets, exchanges ideas, and also this great enthusiasm and participation is contagious because, I mean, more you see, more you want to be part of it. So it's really a great event. <laughs> I think this is a very interesting event. You get to see a lot of people that bring very different perspectives and they look at what you're doing in, in, a, in a critical way and they look at it uh, probably very differently than what you thought originally. And it's very, very nice to have the exchange. The symbol is located somewhere over here. You never know where the innovation is going to come from. We have specific objectives in Horizon 2020 about focus and pace as well, about the, the speed of bringing solutions to the market, generating that economic benefit and the growth and the jobs. The European funding was absolutely essential for this project because it's a groundbreaking project, it's, uh, it's uh, blue sky research and that would not have been possible without European funding. We want to include all the kids that normally are excluded and we want to empower them to become creators instead of just being consumers. And this award allows us to reach more kids, it's a marketing instrument for us. We're in the second year of a three-year project, and now is the time to really start thinking about how we take this forward beyond the, the uh, end of a project in a year's time. You know, do we present it forward commercially? Do we charge people for it? Do we use crowdfunding? Is it a social benefit? First of all, internet, the internet, and internet. That's for sure. The internet of things. Uh, uh, collaboration on the internet, uh, working on it, that's for sure, but also the new frontier science. So it's a long list, uh, but I would say all with the same fil rouge, which is European innovation and really leading in the world. The ICT event is great, 6,000 people. You know, more than 5 million people in Twitter follow the event. It's great, it's important because it's the Agora where everyone meets, exchanges ideas, and also this great enthusiasm and participation is contagious because, I mean, more you see, more you want to be part of it. So it's really a great event. <laughs> I think this is a very interesting event. You get to see a lot of people that bring very different perspectives and they look at what you're doing in, in, a, in a critical way and they look at it uh, probably very differently than what you thought originally. And it's very, very nice to have the exchange. The symbol is located somewhere over here. You never know where the innovation is going to come from. We have specific objectives in Horizon 2020 about focus and pace as well, about the, the speed of bringing solutions to the market, generating that economic benefit and the 
growth and the jobs. The European funding was absolutely essential for this project because it's a groundbreaking project, it's, uh, it's uh, blue sky research and that would not have been possible without European funding. We want to include all the kids that normally are excluded and we want to empower them to become creators instead of just being consumers. And this award allows us to reach more kids, it's a marketing instrument for us. We're in the second year of a three-year project and now is the time to really start thinking about how we take this forward beyond the, the uh, end of a project in a year's time. You know, do we present it forward commercially? Do we charge people for it? Do we use crowdfunding? Is it a social benefit? First of all, internet, the internet and internet, that's for sure. The internet of things, uh, uh, collaboration on the internet, uh, working on it, that's for sure, but also the new frontier science. So it's a long list, uh, but I would say all with the same field rouge, which is European innovation and really leading in the world. Cream on top? Oh, so good, huh? Okay, who's had Zacher Torta? Not good? Yeah, nice? Most critically, what is the question I'm going to ask you? Who has... What? Who has tweeted? I think we can do better. It's better than yesterday. Who has retweeted? Who's too lazy to tweet but just goes, yeah, like, yeah, retweet, like, yeah? Okay, come on. We need to literally, well, we're about to talk about cybersecurity, explode the system with multiple tweets, okay? So please, there are so many good quotes. I've written down so many. You don't have to invent your own thing. Just quote something spectacular that one of our great speakers has said, okay? So, you have two more minutes to mumble amongst yourselves, to book a restaurant for tonight, to chat with your mates, to do whatever you need to do to answer an email, because you shouldn't really be away from work, and then we are going to begin. But we are going to finish bang on 11, okay? We're not going to go over time. So, voila, see you in just a moment. Chat away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for the clapping.
I have reappeared. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, all of you. Those of you here with me in Vienna in this fabulous Congress Center, and of course, those of you joining us online for day two of this EU Austrian Presidency event extravaganza. It really is the flagship event on all things research, innovation, and digital. And we're exploring all the big and the small issues related to really driving the EU forwards in this domain. At the heart of this, as I said yesterday, of course, we have the DSM, and we also have the Digital Europe Program proposal, which was actually uh, launched just this year in June. Now, at the heart of all our discussions, I just want to remind you, and it's a point that I made several times yesterday, this is all about transforming society. So we really are asking, what can all of this do to benefit the different citizens around Europe? And everybody's going to have their different needs and their different sensibilities. So that really is the red thread that is running through everything. First thing on a housekeeping point of view, can I just check that you've got your phones on silent? Please, that's very, very important. Can you check that? I know I have been hassling you like mad to tweet. There, ta-da, okay. The great thing today is there is going to be, in theory, if the technicians are allowed to do it, I don't know if the building will withstand it, but there should be a, a, a ticker tape of tweets. So as I said yesterday, if nothing makes you tweet, vanity should if you want to see it up there, okay? So this morning, as you saw on the screen, we're discussing cybersecurity as key for a digital economy and society. And I've got six fabulous speakers, and they're going to be assisted by you, who I hope will use Slido for your questions and your comments to explore strategic areas where the EU needs to invest its cybersecurity, uh, to protect its economy, society, but also Democracy, what are those EU values it's protecting alongside its citizens? So, are we looking at research? Are we looking at innovation? Are we looking at industrial capabilities? All that is in the mix. We're also, of course, going to explore all of the future challenges posed by all of this pervasive connectivity, all these different systems, all these next-gen technologies. We're going to look at those this afternoon. Data flows, vertical applications. Put your hands up if you absolutely know all of those words and everything that I've just said. For whom is that entirely familiar? 5G, Internet of Things, quantum computing, blockchain. Who is an absolute whiz in all of that? Who has got a sort of a Homer Simpson face? A little bit, for some of that. Thank you. Who will absolutely not put up their hand, even if I ask them to? <laughs> uh, see, that's a good one, isn't it? OK, and of course, critically, we're going to be looking at the EU policy context. That we're going to hear again from uh, Khalil, who we had yesterday. And also, the European Competence Centres. What is that proposal? What does it look like? When are we going to hear about it? Now, there's a lot to get through, and I will get you out of here before 11 o'clock, so we're on time, but I do have an announcement to make. This is very exciting. Today, in the house, as I would say, we have a delegation of the winning team of the European Cyber Security Challenge Competition 2018. You may cheer. And... I love that. There was a lot of turning on. Love it. No, stay safe. So this year, Germany... This year, Germany won this wonderfully, and, and it is incredibly challenging. Would you say it's incredibly challenging? Was it pretty? Is it a well-deserved win, gentlemen? Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. You don't sound very German. You just went, yeah. You German? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, it's an initiative of European countries. It's supported by the EU Agency for Network and Information Security and DG Connect. And it aims at engaging cybersecurity talent. You can stay standing. Are you officially cybersecurity talent, would you say? Would you consider yourself cybersecurity talent? Okay, in Europe with very high potential. So after three, not on three, we're going to give them a very big cheer. Their names are on the screen. One, two, three. And now you may be seated.
I don't think that's what they look like when they're doing their cybersecurity stuff. I think they're in bedrooms being cool and smoking cigarettes in roll necks. But there, you look very, very neat and tidy, gentlemen. So, uh, don't forget Slido, okay? That's very, very important. You can input during the discussions. I'm just not going to open it so that you can see it until we get to that part of the debate. And so, to our first speaker. Could you give a very, very warm round of applause, please, to Khalil Ruana, who you saw yesterday, Deputy Director General, DG Connect, who is going to headline this first session of the day. Thank you very much. Very nice to have you back. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah. Needless to uh, tell you how important is cybersecurity today. I mean, the figures are thrilling when we see uh, the intensity of cyber attacks on our economy, on public administrations, uh, on uh, our citizens as well. So the latest figures, I mean, they show that more than two-thirds or close to 80 percent of our businesses, including SMEs, are at least hacked once per year. Uh, the, uh, uh, that means, uh, you know, if you look at the number of businesses that we have, including SMEs, we're talking about 24 million in the union, and imagine what that means, more than two-thirds attacked systematically. I even saw uh, a study done on the French uh, situation where a large part of our SMEs do not even declare that they've been attacked or are also tempted to, when they hacked for ransom, to pay the ransom. So, I mean, we're in a situation that is uh, extremely uh, risky for the future. So, uh, it is clear that this is a top priority for policymakers and a top priority uh, for digital policies, uh, making the digital transformation of the economy cited more trustful is essential for its development. Security is, uh, to a large extent, a national competence. And uh, in cybersecurity, the, there has been a lot of work done together with the member states to create a coordinated approach and uh, a real uh, EU response to the, this challenge of cyber attacks because cybersecurity is cross-border, and we've seen it with the big attacks, that uh, if you have one part of the union that is fragile, vulnerable, it creates vulnerability across the whole economy. Because our governments are more and more interconnected, our public sector services are more and more interconnected, and our businesses are more and more interconnected across the union. We have supply chain, for our major industrial sectors uh, they, that, that are spread across Europe. And a vulnerability in one part has an uh, uh, impact on the whole supply chain. So uh, since uh, 2010, I would say, in the last 10 years, a lot of progress has been made in order to uh, at address that issue collectively. And uh, with one, one goal, I think, um, if I, I mean, simplify it, it's about shielding the whole of our economy and society from cyber attacks and ensure that we can uh, prevent attacks, that we are resilient to attacks, and that we can deter and respond to attacks when needed. It's a collective work that is done with the member states, different ministries in the member states, not only the ministries responsible for digital uh, economy and digital society, but also the ministry, interior ministries and ministries of defense were needed. And in the union, at the uh, EU institutions, it's a work that we do, of course, with the parliament and council, but also uh, with the, within DG Home, DG Justice, uh, DG Connect, of course, uh, that has the chef of the field for cybersecurity, but also with the EEAS, DG Grow, that that has a part on defense. So it's a collective work and uh, that we do in a very coordinated way. Since 10 years now, a lot of effort are done. Now we're working with all policy instruments that we have. When you do policy, you regulate, you invest, or you coordinate, you uh, raise awareness, and we're, we're, you mobilize. We're working with the three policy instruments that we have. First thing was to get a regulatory framework 
that identifies the responsibilities, the roles of the member states, the roles of the union, create a cooperation agreement, and the roles of the major operators, critical, uh, operators of critical infrastructure, operators of main services, their roles in preventing attacks and shielding themselves, but also their role in reporting on attacks in order to create, uh, to make sure that we can learn from attacks and collectively try to address this. Uh, we had uh, a first regulatory framework that we proposed was in 2013 and to show you how delicate this issue is because it touches on national security, it took us three years to get an agreement on what we call Network and Information Security Directive, a major milestone because that really identified the different roles and created for the first time a framework for collaboration, uh, collaboration at a strategic level and collaboration when it comes to prevention and preparation of operational capacities. And we have uh, different groups that work on policy level, cooperation, but also on, on, so on strategic level, but also on operational level. And we have set up an agency, uh, European Network and Information Security Agency, NISA, that helps in this cooperation, has a major role in uh, sharing information and uh, bringing the groups together and diffusion of information and uh, uh, reinforcing our capacities. And we work on our capacities in technology, industrial capacities. We work also on our operational capacities where we, this regulatory framework that we have set up enables us to also cooperate operationally. That was the first uh, regulatory framework that we put on the table. And then we came now last year with a big package where we uh, revised our strategy for cybersecurity. We proposed a new legislative act also, we called it the Cybersecurity Act. So it adds to the NIS regulation, the NIS sorry, regulatory framework. It adds uh, 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 a new le legislative framework uh, that with, with two things inside, one is two major uh, blocks inside. One major uh, block is about reinforcing the role of the agency and make it more uh, uh, sustainable in the future, in ESA, but also a new proposal for a cybersecurity certification scheme, EU-wide uh, cert certification scheme. This legislation is still in... Uh, co-decision between Parliament and Council, and we're confident because things have moved, and now we're at the stage of trilogue, so the two institutions and the Commission are discussing how to finalize uh, this text, and hopefully we can get that before the end of the year. Uh, I know that the Austrian Presidency is working hard together with the Parliament to get that through. So, two major legislative frameworks, Network Information Security uh, Directive that uh, uh, get, creates the framework, identifies the roles, identifies the collaboration frameworks, and, and helps us put them in practice, an agency, and a new uh, legislative proposal to reinforce the role of the agency, reinforce our operational capacity, the coordination of our operational capacity, and reinforces also the, and brings in uh, a very important uh, legislation regarding certification of products and services. But that's on the regulatory side. On the investment side, we have uh, uh, been working now since, since 10 years also on reinforcing our research innovation activities in cybersecurity with an increase, a substantial increase in our investment in cybersecurity research in H2020 and doing that in a partnership with industry who created a, a, a public-private partnership on cybersecurity, as you know, where the investment is done following a roadmap established by the academic and the industrial community, of course, but also national security agencies and the users, not only the suppliers of solutions for ICT security, but more and more we're bringing also the big industrial users across the union. So, uh, public-private partnerships, our investment has increased 
Today it reaches, I was looking at the last work programs, 18, 19, 20. Our investment in age 2020 is around 125 to 150 million euro per year on cybersecurity, and that is done in the societal challenge on security and resilience, and it's done also in, the, uh, uh, in, in ICT uh, leadership and enabling and industrial technology, so ICT light. If you take the two combined, we get close to 100, 100, uh, 125 to 150 million euro per year. We've reinforced that with a call also that we set up uh, as we announced in September in 2017 as part of our uh, cybersecurity package. We uh, issued a call to reinforce the collaboration coordination between the research centers across Europe so that we can build common agendas for research and development and to do that together with industry, involving industry in use cases, etc. That's the call that we have foreseen for 50 million euros and our investment would go even higher than 50 million euros to bring the research community across Europe. What we realize is that we have a lot of fragmentation uh, uh, in the, the way we address cybersecurity, we have a lot of very good teams all across Europe, but if you look at the, uh, at the landscape, it's uh, a large number of small teams, and there is a big added value of coordinating this work, uh, facilitating the coordination and the collaboration to be able to bring critical mass of investments, critical mass of research effort to address the major challenges. That's what we have done. Uh, in terms of research innovation, uh, a public-private partnership, an increase in investments, substantial increase in investments. We used to be around 25, 30 million euro per year in, uh, six, six, seven years ago. We're today 125 to 150 million. But our ambition for cybersecurity are even bigger when it comes to the next financial framework. And we have the two strands, research innovation under Horizon Europe where we have cybersecurity as a clear intervention area under the industrial, under the security and resilience, uh, resilience society cluster in the commission proposal. It's a major intervention area. And we have also cybersecurity key enabling technologies that we address in the four other big tickets that we have proposed for Horizon Europe, be it in the key digital technologies, microelectronics, up to software or in the smart connectivity where, I mean, cybersecurity is extremely important. So we have a dedicated intervention area on cybersecurity in one of the clusters under the pillar two of Horizon Europe, and we have all other key technologies also where cybersecurity will be important that will be addressed under the digital industry cluster. That's our investment in Horizon Europe. Based on the budgets that are there, the, the budgets could go between 700 up to a billion euros that we could expect on cybersecurity, research, and innovation, and Horizon Europe. That will depend also on your input and how we frame that in the future, and this is part of our strategic planning that we have put in place to prepare for the first work programs in Horizon Europe. That's our investment and in research innovation. But in addition to that, on the Digital Europe program, we proposed a big investment, 2 billion euros, in building our capacities for cybersecurity. Uh, building our capacities, i.e. computing capacities, software development tools, preparing for post-quantum cryptography, investing in quantum communication, investing possibly in quantum computers, to be ever the first movers in deploying latest technologies to shield our economy, our society and to make sure that this technology is available for SMEs, for businesses, but mainly also for areas of public interest to shield our health system, healthcare systems, to shield our administrations, etc. This is 2 billion euros, extremely important if we want to deploy these technologies and be among the first movers in shielding our economy and society. So that's what we're doing on the investment side. We're working together with the member states, with industry also, to share awareness and uh, educate uh, the, uh, our citizens, educate our, our SMEs, businesses on the danger and the threat and how they could address cybersecurity uh, with latest tools. And that's coming also uh, as you know, our third type of actions that we do together with ENISA, as I mentioned before, but also work that we're doing on the ground with a large part of the member states. So, if you want, this is an overview of the policy instruments, of the policy objectives, our approach, and 
how we're using our instruments, regulatory, financial, investment research innovation, investment and deployment, and our coordination, awareness sharing, and awareness raising, uh, and sharing of best practices in order to shield our economy and make sure that the digital transformation is taking place in the most secure way uh, across the Union and to have a strong technology industrial capacities in Europe. This is very important and uh, the, all these uh, measures are uh, designed together with you, be it in the partnerships or the, the, through the consultations. And uh, today's discussion is part of the way we consult and we interact with you on uh, cybersecurity, which is a key priority for us. Thank you very much. Don't go, don't go. One, oh, Kale, one question. Sorry, just grab the microphone, just one second. Okay. Um, t just to say kindly for the next speakers, because they're going to be no more than five minutes, can we just really ensure that the timer works for them? Because I think they'll rely upon it. Come and join me one moment, because I just want to pull out one thing. You need to be here. Otherwise, Remy's lovely stage, we get hidden there. Very good. I keep referring to the lovely Remy, but, you know, I have to. So, uh, a quick question. Absolutely critical, the identification of roles. This is what you said, role. And you said that there's lots of talent out there, but it's terribly fragmented. So me, coming from the outside, goes, the whole point of cybersecurity is to prevent the chaos that, that can ensue. So identification of roles and responsibilities is obviously very important, and you said the monitoring. You said right at the start, SMEs don't declare. They don't really, in a nutshell, why do you think those SMEs? They think it's just, oh, business as usual, we'll get on it with it, we'll fix it. Why don't they declare it? Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, first there is lack of awareness of uh, the... Uh, oh, you need to be a bit closer. The, the, yes, there's yes. a lack of awareness of what is at stake. So I think it's something that will happen just once, okay, so... Uh, okay, we'll uh, just do well, it. Yes, just okay. do it, and then it gets repeated, and then they, they feel how important that is. So we have a role, there is a role of us of uh, uh, awareness raising, of sure. the, the importance of uh, shielding yourself from yeah. cyber threats is very important. Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the awareness is, is getting... Uh, better and better, uh, but still there's a lot of work to be done on this sure. issue. So that's when, when it comes to SMEs. When it comes to the fragmented effort and our technology industrial capacity, what I could say is that Europe is strong in some areas of the cybersecurity technology chain. We're very good on the component side, you know that Europe produces more than 55% of the components that you could see in our smart cards, that you could see in our devices uh, for cybersecurity. We're very good in this area because we're good in smart cards, we're the first one to adopt it, but we're less good in the higher layers. What our analysis showed is that when it comes to investments in latest technologies, high forms computing, self-healing systems, quantum, quantum cryptography tools, uh, quantum key distribution. We're, uh, we're very, the, uh, the effort is very concentrated or non-existing even. So that means that for these high cost investments, collaboration is essential. Okay. And this is what we're proposing to do. Okay. He's great to see you. Give him the microphone. He could actually sing to you now, you see. I think you, liked, I think you would have liked to have done the whole thing here and not there. Yeah, I did, I know. And you know what, it's because we started late and I've got to get you out on time and I've got to hear. So please, you're staying with us, correct? No, you're going? Or you're coming into the living room? You're going there? Continue without you, you've done your thing? Can you please just face them so they can give you a very warm round of applause. Thank you so much. Look, it's great. You kind of walked down this, this, this fabulous stage. Thank you very, very much and thank you for setting the scene. So, ladies and gents who remain, please, five minutes, no more, okay? Or I will literally rugby tackle you to the ground. So, uh, the next speaker is the very brainy, I'm assuming, uh, Dr. Stephanie Vayner. She is working towards a large-scale quantum internet as professor at QTech, which is the Delft University of Technology. And I think, if I've got this right, she's one of the founders of QCrypt, which has become the largest conference in quantum cryptography. Do you wish to have this? Yes, please. There you go, my lovely. The floor is yours, no stress. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome to this morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about quantum communication. And quantum communication can bring many benefits to cybersecurity. So you might be wondering, what is quantum communication? 
So over the internet today, we send classical bits, zero and ones. And the objective of a quantum internet is to send quantum bits or qubits, which can be both zero and one at the same time. And these qubits are pretty special. Namely, they cannot be copied. And in fact, any attempt to do so can be detected. This makes qubits naturally very well suited to applications that ask for security. So why do we want to do quantum communication? So this is the session on cybersecurity. And the most famous application of quantum communication is quantum secure communication. Here, security can be mathematically proven even if the attacker who's trying to read your messages has a quantum computer now or also in the future or more sophisticated computational methods might be discovered. Quantum communication can also enable secure quantum computing in the cloud. One popular or in, uh, application of early stage quantum computers is quantum simulations to test the properties of new materials and medicines. Using quantum communication, a simple quantum device can use a remote quantum computer in the cloud in such a way that this computer cannot learn the material design that you want to explore in your simulation. Quantum communication has many other applications, for example, synchronizing clocks or other applications, cybersecurity for password identification, position verification, coordination in online games, and also blockchain technologies. And there's many more uh, already know. Quantum communication is also useful to offer a scalable path towards building a large-scale quantum computer by networking together small quantum computers into one more powerful quantum computing cluster. It's useful to understand that quantum communication, even though quantum technologies, of course, always sound very futuristic, uh, are actually already reality today. You can go out and buy a box uh, that does quantum secure communication over short distances, around 100 kilometers, in normal telecom fiber. If you go online and you Google quantum networks, you will also discover that, for example, in China, they have uh, made a longer link uh, by stacking together 100 kilometer segments. So this is an early stage test, which does not yet achieve end-to-end -end security, uh, but all the sort of intermediate points of these 100 kilometer segments, called trusted nodes, actually need to be trusted, which is, of course, not what we ultimately want, but it's a first step to deployment. There have also been early tests to create quantum entanglement from space. So quantum entanglement is a certain quantum feature and that can also enable you to send qubits over large distances. So how to go forward from there? So this is the session on ICT. And uh, in fact, this is not a technology, I think, that only touches upon the physics or where it kind of originates, but that has an intersection, in fact, with the entire field of ICT. So, for example, artificial intelligence plays a useful role in, in fact, the design and also control of quantum devices. And you can imagine that if you want to put quantum networks into practice, you actually need all the sort of usual players that appear in the classical domain. So hardware, software, infrastructure, services all need to kind of come together in order to make that happen. So going forward, one basically wants to optimize three things. The first one in the short term is accessibility. So going beyond the point-to-point -point scenario to create say, star-shaped networks in areas, for example, here in the Netherlands, where most of the sort of uh, uh, businesses, in fact, are located, uh, to allow as many people as possible to have end-to-end -end security in a smaller region. The other two things one wants to optimize are functionality. Namely, we want to be able to basically connect small quantum processors and in fact, by the end of 2020, we want to set up a small demonstration network in the Netherlands of this kind to be able to run more complicated applications than just, just sort of quantum key distribution. And the last thing that we want is we want to build quantum repeaters. And quantum repeaters are necessary in order to allow us to send qubits over very long distances uh, with the objective to eventually connect all of Europe. Thank you very much.
Can join me just one second. Thank you. First of all, excellent use of the stage. I was very happy with the excellent use of the stage there. I'm going to ask you something completely different to that. I am a 53-year-old Bulgarian woman working in a bank in Sofia, and I'm in a brasserie with you. And I say, so how does all of this quantum stuff make me safer online and in the digital era? In one sentence, how do you explain it to her so she understands why it's relevant for her? Maybe I would then have to ask a very personal question, namely, what are your online activities? Who? <laughs> that somehow sounds, even the word online activity sounds slightly dodgy. Very, very boring. Yeah. So uh, I think actually, uh, I think there can be many applications. Uh, one of them, of course, in the domain of security. Uh, that may depend on your particular online activities and how paranoid uh, you are about them uh -huh. and uh, how much security you would want to achieve. Uh, there's many fun applications, in fact, that people have played with. So I mentioned, for example, coordination in online games. Yeah. Uh, where people have shown that if you have entanglement, then two players, even though they don't communicate, but one can achieve coordination instantaneously, can actually win that game more often. Okay. So, you know, maybe in the future, the main application will be in gaming. Okay. <laughs> Are you a gamer? Oh, it's more like a joke, but yeah. Are you a gamer? Uh, not really, no, but... Yeah. I love that. I love specialising <laughs> in areas where that's fabulous. Okay, thank you very much. Can you give a round yeah. of applause for breaking the ice and using the stage, number one? My lovely, you, um, you can go and take a seat in the living room. Thank you very, very, very much. So, uh, we're going to now move on to our second speaker, and our second speaker is Andrzej Wolczek. He is Executive Vice President and General Manager, Consumer, in the Consumer Bit, at the Czech multinational cybersecurity software company, Avast. A very warm round of applause. Thank you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I've been in the field of cybersecurity for over 25 years. Started pretty early. Um, and so I've seen it sort of developing from a pretty modest space uh, with uh, where, you know, the old virus has been created more for bragging rights or for fun, if you will, all the way to where we are today, to mass account breaches, to hacktivism, to state-sponsored attacks, uh, ransomware, etc. And so um, it's kind of fascinating to see uh, that, that big shift uh, and, and the amount of money, the amount of incentives really in this space now. And, um, Obviously, we've got very limited time today to talk about all these things, but uh, if I'm to focus on one thing specifically, which I think is really important in case of cybersecurity, it's IoT, or Internet of Things. So according to Gartner, in 2020, there will be about 19 billion devices connected to the Internet. It's only about 720 million PCs on the consumer side, about four or five billion mobile devices, and then there is like 80% of those other devices that don't really count as traditional, that is not as computer servers, mobiles, et cetera. These are these, some other devices that are not that visible. And they include all these applications, smart homes, all these sensors, wearables, baby monitors, et cetera. Actually, 60% of those devices are expected to be in the consumer space, only 40% to be in the industrial space. And, uh, there is also a huge diversity or fragmentation, if you will, in terms of the platforms that are being used in those devices. If you look at PCs or servers or mobile devices, there's a pretty big homogeneity in terms of platforms. There's, on mobile, there's really a duality between the Apple world and the Google world, while in the IoT space, there's dozens and dozens of vendors, protocols and frameworks, toolkits, et cetera, that are being used. And all of this really creates this interesting underpinning for security because there's such a diversity of options, of possibilities for the bad guys to attack. And so when I look at the space as, in, as, as a whole in terms of the, 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 the relative security or let's say danger level of these devices, I'm actually quite scared uh, because can say in general that the security situation of most of these devices is dismal. It kind of looks like the 90s or the, you know, let's say late 80s, early 90s, where it was really easy to find new vulnerabilities, new binary 
sort of uh, uh, you know ex exploitable holes or remote code execution problems, etc. And that's exactly what I'm seeing on on, on those uh, new IoT devices. There. Why is that? I think there's a couple of reasons. First, the problem isn't that visible. That is, don't, most people don't realize the problem exists. It's not as widely used yet by the bad guys, but unfortunately, I think these times are coming. Second, there is little, little financial incentive uh, for, the, for the device vendors or for anyone to care. It doesn't really make much difference whether you create a truly secure device versus you create a totally crappy device when it comes to security. And thirdly, Frankly, I don't think the, most of the device vendors actually know what they are doing. They've been in the business of making their devices for, say, decades. If you are a coffee maker, coffee machine maker, then you've been making your coffee machines for 100 years, brews beautiful, great coffee. But you frankly don't know much about creating software, not to mention secure software. So now that you are subjected with connecting your device to the internet, you basically don't know what you are doing. And there's little, little help that you are getting from the external world to, to, to do that. So are we doomed? I, I don't think we are. Uh, I see some good uh, early signals that, uh, that things are changing. I think the problem that we are now facing is larger than anything else that we have seen before, and it will re require a concerted effort between the regulators, that is, for example, the EU here, and the device vendors, and the security industry, and the general public, that is the consumer especially, uh, as well, kind of demanding higher standards, higher level of security. I've seen some early uh, things in Japan, in California now with some regulations uh, around IoT security, but these are still very, very early. Uh, I see some vendors now using cyber security as a key differentiator it is in their marketing materials, which is great. And I also see some security vendors really starting to focus on IoT and using IoT and AI, which is kind of the technology that most people would use for cyber, cyber securing those devices uh, as, as the new sort of trend and as the new area of investment. So overall, I think the situation is really serious. It's really great. We have to focus on it. By the end of the day, I think there is a bright future ahead of us. And uh, finally, the IoT devices will become part of kind of the convenience, and they will, they will somehow um, do what they were supposed to do. Thank you. Grab the mic a second. Just a quick. I am being, come, come here, don't be scared. I am being even more Hurricane Katrina today. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, but we lost 10 minutes at the outset. So we had the, Khalil spoke to us about SMEs and, and you used two words, they're dismal, doomed, but you don't think we're quite doomed. But you said it requires a concerted effort and on the part of regulators. In a nutshell, do you sense, do you see evidence that that sense of urgency is there, that speed is, you know, there is a realization that we need to speed up? Um, not so much, unfortunately. No? Uh, again, uh, there's something in Japan, there's something in California now, and it's very, very light. It's not very fast. The California thing is only coming into effect by 2020. Right. I haven't really seen much out of the EU, so that's one of the things I would like to discuss here, how we can expedite these things, because I think it's really urgent. Okay, all right. Well, hold that thought, and hopefully we will have time to discuss that further. Can you give a very, I will grab that from you, can you give a very big round of applause to this gentleman, and can you join this lovely lady up in the sitting room? Thank you very much. So, and forgive me, I hope when I introduce our speakers uh, that I have, I'm introducing you with the correct titles. If I'm not, feel free to uh, tell these good people who you really are, okay? So, our next speaker is Dr. Anand Prasad. He is Chief Advanced Technologist at NET Corporation. So that's a corporation that integrates technology and expertise to create the ICT-enabled society of tomorrow. And I think you lead, come sir, you lead the mobile communication security activity, mobile communications standardization. That's your key area. Are you doing this or are you doing that? You know, I think I'll stay here. Absolutely. There you go. The floor is yours, sir. All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the introduction. And uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, you know, I was thinking to hold the mic uh, first and uh, but you know, sometime back, uh, I was kicked and I didn't block properly. 
So I didn't calculate the risk properly and I got attacked and therefore the pain stays here sometimes when it gets cold. That's the security in our day-to-day -day life that I want to touch. We can discuss that later uh, a bit more. But you also saw security in our life here when entering uh, the conference center here. When going to the airport, you are checked. When you're paying for something, you are checked as well. And you also see about your privacy, confidentiality, integrity, protection, and things like that. I just want to say security is so ingrained in our life that we take it for granted. And you know, when we take things for granted, we start expecting it comes from someone else, and therefore everything will be fine. Uh, that's why we hear more and more about security issues. Yeah? And when it comes to mobile communications, it's connecting so many things. The data that goes in, the data that goes out, the data that stays. I don't like the word trust when I talk about security, but still, trustworthiness becomes important. And when you talk about mobile communications business itself, it works by identifying someone and identification happens by authentication. And that authentication leads to service users, and then the service gets monitored, and after that, payment happens for that. Yeah? That's the basics of the mobile communication business. Otherwise, we all would not be here. Having stated that the importance of security, I believe most of you understand, but very often I get into a group, peop uh, people who don't understand so much about security, so I want, want to touch that. Now, going through my uh, slide, let's see, does it work? Yes. Uh, I'll go through three slides, each of them for a couple of hours worth, but uh, uh, given the time that I have now three minutes left, I'll just go through them quickly. So the previous slide, let me go back again. Um, here I just want to show in one picture about the changes that 5G is bringing. Uh, one of the biggest thing, what I say is that the perimeter, the area where the network ends is not there anymore. It's going down to some software block inside the network. Yeah. So therefore, we have to give different kind of protection. We are talking about hardware where, where the security credentials were being stored in the network. I'm talking about the network side. And now they, them being softwareized, and I like that interesting word, softwareized, uh, being virtualized and being cloud-based, which has different security implications. And then you're getting off-the-shelf hardware as well. Uh, in this picture, you have quite a few things, and you'll get lost in there. It's better to listen to me, maybe. Uh, you have different kind of IoT devices, each of them having their own requirements. Some will connect through very high data rate, uh, requiring low latency, and therefore you see the processing should be low. Others have very lean, require very long battery life, and therefore that says how much bits should be sent over the air. And then there is a user space. You have people who understand and people who will connect for the first time. They should be taken care of as well. Much more here, but I'll continue. The next slide that I want to say is about 5G specifications that from 3GPP perspective, that's a group I chair, uh, 3GPP SC3. We had phase one and phase two. And in phase one, we have standardized several things that will, that's already available as specifications, all of them listed out over there. And phase two, we are doing a bit more, just uh, saying a few points. Unified authentication, that means all kind of authentication can be taken care of by one database, and different kind of authentication mechanisms can be used. Inter-operator security, that is taking care of many issues, fraud issues, and also other different security issues that are existing actually today. Uh, home control is there. That basically means, again, fraud will not happen. There is privacy from the very beginning. MC catcher issues will not happen. You have security from the very beginning, from the first message itself. That is a big impact on architecture, big impact on business and everything. Let me move on, given the time limitation. Now, going towards the end of my talk, when you talk about security, you have to consider many, many, many different things. I've just put a couple of blocks out there. Uh, maybe there are some other aspects as well. Yeah. You have to think about how the implementation happens. You have to think about the, how the deployment happens. But we are talking about mobile communication, so you also have to think about lawful interception. It's extremely important. Yeah. That's all besides what we specify in 3GPP or other standardization bodies. So holistic security, security from first step, and moving fast. I say the word cyber 2050 will be in 2020. The pace is quite fast when it comes to technology, and security has to keep up with that. With that, I guess uh, I am almost done with my time. So thank you very much. And you're welcome to ask me lots of questions. I look forward to that. It's just horrible, isn't it? It's just too little time.
It's awful. Don't be scared. You're killing me. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> One quick thing to just go back on yeah, before yeah. I ask you to join them. Yeah. Just explain to me in three sentences, what does that mean, lawful interception? <laughs> All right, this was, I was not, I was hoping not to be caught on that, but, oh. <laughs> all right, uh, mobile communications uh, is, is a network that's essential for our life, yeah, and lawful interception basically means that legally, uh, uh, say, uh, um, mission critical or police or someone is allowed to follow what you are doing. Okay. Say a case that someone is hijacked, mm -hmm. you want to protect the quick person, uh, uh, those being hijacked, yeah, and you want to protect the person who is trying to help them as well. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, and who defines the lawful interception? Government, civil society, together, who does that? It's Security a, services? It, it's a, it, it should be the legal side of the government. <laughs> okay, should <laughs> there be the legal side. There are many things behind, of, behind that. Okay, all right, thank you. You did well to answer. I don't know why you were scared to answer. You did well. <laughs> I'll take that, sir. Please join our fellow guests in the living room. Thank you. A warm round of applause to this gentleman, please. Don't be scared, lovely speakers. I hope that you will have more time when we're up there if there are other things that you couldn't say and you want to say. Okay. So, we are now going to introduce Dr. Kai Rannenberg. He is Chair of Mobile Business and Multilateral Security at the Goethe University Institute in Frankfurt and also visiting professor since 2012 at the National Institute for Informatics, Tokyo, Japan. So, that will give us a really nice overview from some different perspectives. Please give this gentleman a round of applause. You are also, are you going to stroll? Uh, let's see. Stroll let's see whether I can. Stroll away, When I fall sir. down, you have to save me. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks. Congratulations for overcoming the security controls to be able to come to the um, security session. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you a bit more about the vision of more trustworthy communication devices that I think we need and the discussion about lawful interception and we already had. Because what we actually have now, and I have to thank Anand for his vision on 5G. There is a great perspective with 5G, lots of wonderful applications, but I think I need to make a housekeeping announcement here. And the housekeeping announcement is that nowadays devices are actually insecure. Um, that holds especially for smartphones. Um, you have lots of um, features on these smartphones that are not controlled from the user. They're not even controlled from lawful interception, even though we can discuss, about, discuss quite a bit on who is actually defining what is lawful interception and what is not. But they can manipulate it externally, for example, from the developers of the apps, and, and in very many cases for reasons that are really not really reasons. I don't know whether you tried out in your recent app phone um, the flashlight app if you have an older Android phone or something like else, you will find out if you check, and some of my PhD students have done that, that the flashlight app is going to tell um, the developer where you are. Why does a flashlight app need to tell the developer where my mobile phone is? There is no real reason for that. And that is happening, of course, because the developer is interested in learning more about us. It's good if people like to learn more about us, but this is not the kind of thing that I would like to have learned about um, when I'm not even in control of it. And there's lots of these kind of cases. There's lots of situations where app phones are, and app markets are not informing people about it. And there's this recent report on and Google that actually, even when you say, I don't want to have certain data transferred, they are still being transferred. So we need to do something um, about that. And I think what we need is we need improvements on several levels. We need them with regard to trustworthy hardware. We need them with regard to more robust operating systems. We need more privacy-friendly apps where really users are in control of things. And we need better app markets that when you want to choose an app, you need to understand what are the consequences of using this app comparing to using another app. And then, of course, when you get a long list of properties being presented to you, the question is, can you understand it? Yes, many of you in the room can, because you are actually security experts. But when I'm asking my mom, or my mom is asking me, should I install this app or not? And then I need to take a long look, and of course I can try to do that, and most of the things I even understand, but it takes very long. And many people don't have, have a professor as a son in the family who can help them installing apps. And it needs to work even when you don't have somebody like that in the family. And from that point of view, we need better applications, better evaluations of these apps, and presentation of that in a way that people can actually understand it. There was a cybersecurity conference adjacent to this, and one of the politicians said, well, we do not only need to do cybersecurity, we need to do cybersecurity in a way that the citizen understands that we're doing cybersecurity. And I think that was a wise statement from a politician, and I tend to be critical when I hear politicians talking. So what is actually, I think, what we need? 
And I think what could become maybe something like a lighthouse project. We need and the trustworthy communicator, probably there can be a nicer name. I think we have proper personal people like Katrina who will find a wonderful name for this. But it needs to be a device, and that is maybe a smartphone that help my, helps my mother to surf, that can deal with the basic communication needs, but it is really trustworthy and that you can, and that you can use without having to worry. It will never be perfectly secure. We know that. We have seen these five gentlemen here. Nothing will be secure and, and against these five gentlemen, but it can be better than today. I think it will and you will confirm to me that it can be done. It can be done better than what we have nowadays. And it will benefit many, many sectors and the people there because it can be useful in healthcare. I mean, quite a bit of sens um, sensitive communication is happening in healthcare. It can be useful in transport because location data is extremely sensitive to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with in a better fashion. It can help in any kind of household and internal things scenario. And it can, and again, that I think someone who's important things in Europe, it can benefit private people, citizens, and it can benefit SMEs. Because small and medium enterprises, again, they are the ones who need to take off an off-the-shelf hardware, off-the-shelf software, because they cannot afford a big security department and to deal with it and to do all the analysis and get developments for themselves. So it would be useful to have that. And it can, at the same time, I think, bundle and sparehind, sparehead that part of the European ICT industry that we have that can build these kind of things and put them into a joint, and into a joint effort. Some people said, hey, you're trying to start an Airbus project, something of that size, something of, of Galileo dimensions. It may be, but I think it is important and I think it can be useful for us. And I think still, at the moment, Europe is strong enough to do such an investment. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And you say I could invent a better name, but actually, trustworthy communicator is a fabulous because we don't have too many of those. I mean, I'll just think of Trump as one and my own prime minister as another for now. So I think if we could achieve a trustworthy communicator, whether in a kind of a digital sense or a real sense, it would be a huge achievement. Just to say one thing, I was really staggered by this. App markets don't inform about data flows. My goodness. Do you think so? The public are, I think probably very unaware of this, no? I would, well, Here, uh, quite, a, quite a few of them, I think, ah, I don't know, when you last time you installed an app, how much did you know what kind of information is that app transferring? Well, the truth is, is, it was the app for this event, so I was merely assuming that I was safe, uh, but I don't this know. This is European community, this is okay, European Union, this sure. is probably perfect. Yeah. No, but otherwise, indeed, we have seen quite a few examples where harmless apps, like showing off a flashlight, organizing your own things. All of this actually in relates in, con, in re results in being all kinds of information being transferred to the developers, transferred elsewhere. And I mean, when you do some kind of analyzer on your smartphone, you can see that. But right. it is unfortunately not as good as it should be. Uh, one of the perspectives, like one of my PhD students did that, he said, okay, we need to have an information about that. And then he came for the five-dimensional vector with 20 elements in it, which is wonderful for computer science students. And you just look at your face. So what yeah. after his research he came up with, we need at least something like a simple traffic light system. Red, sure. yellow, green so, yeah, in yeah. terms of this is okay, this is yeah. iffy, you want to look into the details, and hey, keep away from that. Okay, and my, thank you. And my last piece of advice to the assembled company and to myself is, if you're a little bit drunk on beer or gin and you're swaying outside your front door with the flashlight on your phone to put your key into the lock? Don't do it. Don't use that flashlight because now we know where the data is going and we don't want to be going it. Don't want it to get it going to the wrong people. So that, you know, the one thing I'm going to take away from this conference is that yes. flashlight use. And especially it's, when it's at a door which is not your home but where you don't want to tell anybody oh, where you're, you have you're, been actually. Oh, oh, you're adding a whole other layer there. We'll discuss that later. Thank you very much. Can you please give this gentleman a very big round of applause? Thank you. Do take a seat here. Just out of interest, because we either have one or two other speakers, so can I just see if Jasper Rasmussen is in the house? Oh, right, you're not speaking next. Don't be too keen, but I'm so delighted you're there, because we've been like headless chickens, wondering if you're actually present. Okay, so first of all, there's a huge hashtag there. Please, guys, tweet. Go on. That's just what I'm saying, go on, all right? So, two more speakers. I'm now very, very delighted to introduce Alexandra Man uh, Maniati. She's Head of Financing Growth at the European Banking Federation. So we're gonna get a perspective from a different sector now. Thank you very much. You may give her a very warm round of applause. Are you here? Thank you, Katrina. Um, 
just for uh, accuracy, I'm a senior policy advisor on cybersecurity uh, at the European Banking Federation. Good morning from me too. And before I begin, a quick sentence on who the European Banking Federation is. So we are located in Brussels. We represent 32 national banking associations from the countries of the European Union, the EA and EFTA. And our members, in turn, uh, represent some 3,500 banks from all over Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, prosperity is um, a basic objective of the European project. Now, whatever shape or form each of us give to their own individual prosperity, the fact is that we need financial security in order to sustain it. In an era where digital uh, our assets and transactions become more and more digital, we can't have financial security without cybersecurity. Now, if I were to describe briefly the current situation for cybersecurity in the banking sector, I would mention two points. First of all, the scale. It's not only that the number of attacks is um, increasing, it's also that we have and um, a diversity of actors initiating those attacks. So alongside tech-savvy individuals connected to organized crime um, or aiming to disrupt, we also now have state-sponsored actors, and we also have uh, individuals and groups purchasing crime as a service on the dark web, hiring cyber criminals to do the job for them. On the other hand, when it comes to the prey, um, the objective of those attacks, um, money has also has been traditionally the reason why banks have been targeted by criminals. But nowadays, data is also the new gold. And banks have high volumes of data uh, on their clients' um, finances and transactions. In this environment, I would see three key challenges when it comes to cybersecurity in the banking sector. First of all, managing cyber risks in an increasingly complex, interconnected, and growing uh, chain of actors, wherein banking services are offered through multiple channels. They are heavily uh, dependent on different sectors like energy and telecommunications and have opened up to new actors, often non-banks. A second challenge is to ensure a harmonized, consistent, and adequate regulation and supervision for all actors in this uh, complex chain in order to ensure better cyber resilience and customer protection. And in an environment where, as Commission statistics tell us, 43% of European citizens lack basic digital skills, when at the same time 95% of cybersecurity successful attacks um, are uh, attributed to some kind of human activity, intentional or not. Of course, the third challenge is how to reduce risk related to human behavior by educating, finding and retaining cyber skilled workforce and creating cyber awareness to our customers. It's been said before me, I will repeat it, uh, cybersecurity is not an IT issue for IT people only, it's a shared responsibility. The public and the private sector need to work together across borders and in our view they need to prioritize three levels. We need to work together for continuous and consistent raising of awareness on risks and cyber hygiene. We need to educate um, to review together the, the formal education curricula to create the, cyber, the, the workforce of the future, but also we need to retrain and upskill the existing workforce. Second, we need to work together the private sector with EU institutions like ENISA and like the new European Research and Competence Center uh, for Cybersecurity that is now under discussion in order to better identify the needs of the industry, but also of the consumers, and be able to provide better solutions. And lastly, uh, we need to work together to create EU-level trusted platforms to exchange actionable information so that we can better prevent cyber threats and quicker mitigate cyber incidents once those occur. Thank you very much.
thank you. Just take this microphone just a moment that's there, just one second. Um, just to be clear with you, ladies and gentlemen, when, when we finish here with our next speaker, if there is uh, questions on Slido, we're going to go straight to that to open the floor to you before I chat further, just to give you a chance to have your say or pose your questions. Just to say, one of the statistics that, of course, I don't think about is you said 95% of successful attacks are attributed to human activity, purposeful or not. Do we sometimes forget that we can have a serious impact because we're not, for want of a better word, digitally literate, digitally savvy. Is that something that you, is that something that you really do have to think about in your sector? Well, um, yes, it is something that uh, all of us need to think about. First of all, we are all responsible for the cybersecurity of the organisation in which we work, yeah. because just clicking on the wrong link can compromise our whole network. Mm -hmm. So either we are employees or customers or simply individuals at home, we need to have this cybersecurity mindset. Yep. We need to have this little voice in the back of our head before clicking to wonder if it is okay to click. Sure. And I think in your sector particularly, given, given I mean, just to be it's quite simplistic, the economic crisis and the fact that the banking sector has been so much in the headlines for so long, you can't really afford uh, to be in a position where some big news story comes out that people's data, or God forbid, people's money, uh, is seriously under threat. I mean, it must be something very much at the forefront of your activities. It is at the core of our activities because trust is at the core of traditional banking, uh, has, has always been the case. Mm. So when banking becomes digital, then cybersecurity is pretty much at the core of trust. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank you. A warm round of applause, please, for our penultimate speaker. You may join the others. OK. And so, my goodness, Jasper, we really are happy you're in the house. This last gentleman, uh, we knew you were in the building. We just didn't know where. Very clever. He was like a ninja. We couldn't find him. You evaded security. This is Jasper Rasmussen. He is Director of Flight Standards, EASA, so we're going to get a totally different perspective from another sector, which is going to be very interesting. The last five minutes are yours, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I come from EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, so when, when you go flying, that is on behalf of our rules and our oversight together with uh, the mem what the member states are doing. So we are concerned about your safety. Now, um, aviation is already an interconnected system of systems from maintenance, training, aircraft operations, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, when we are facing the digitalization also in the aviation sector, it is creating a significant change in the risk landscape. We normally protect aviation by different layers of protection. We have certification, we have concrete approvals, control, oversight, a lot of different slices, so it's highly unlikely that we will get a failure which actually goes through all the slices of layers of protection. Now, in the area, in, in the, the time of cyber uh, threats, there is a risk that uh, that can be a malicious alignment of all the weak points in our protection uh, of uh, safety. So here we have to address the safety in slightly uh, in a completely different way, uh, because until now we have faced unintended consequences. That is what no, uh, traditional safety is about. When you talk about cyber security and malicious attacks some of the weaknesses in our systems can be aligned. Now, we have on the background of, uh, 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 on the, on the background of the European Commission, which has tasked us to make an action plan for cybersecurity in aviation. We have to make a coordinated defense against cyber threats, and we have to minimize duplication with other initiatives. So we have uh, developed a comprehensive uh, European cybersecurity strategy for aviation. Uh, it is uh, about to be finalized and will be published in the first quarter next year. First, what we did was to create a platform with all involved parties. That is, the European Commission, we have DG Move, DG Connect, DG Grow, DG Home. Uh, we have other European agencies, ENISA, Europol, CERT EU. 
the military sector and the defense agency, NATO, uh, member states, of course, and uh, industrial associations of the aviation sector and international partners as well. So we put all these partners around the table to ensure that we go forward in a coordinated way. So the first takeaway from my presentation can be that it's vital to keep a systemic approach when you talk about a single sector, how to protect against cyber uh, attacks, and with high involvement of the industry all the way. So what is this strategy all about? Let me give you three key actions. First, we will establish a European Center for Cybersecurity in Aviation, EXA it's called. Uh, here, the, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, here we will, uh, together with companies and authorities, try to develop and mature how to exchange information on cyber. This is very difficult, this is very sensitive. We will do it, we will provide information to uh, the members of this uh, uh, European Center uh, from the third EU and also from other sources in aviation. Second, we will develop a flexible and robust cyber regulation for the aviation sector, covering the whole system from maintenance and production to operations uh, and, and, and staff. The, the objective is that all the organizations manage cyber risks following a common risk management approach. Third, we will coordinate initiatives with both Euro European and international cyber partners. Uh, internationally, we have a global aviation uh, organization called ICAO. And in Europe, we will coordinate with uh, ENISA on the NIST directive. How does the coming regulation in aviation fits with the NIST regulation, which is uh, comprehensive and cover all sectors. We have some answers to that question. So the second takeaway from my presentation is that aviation and probably most other sectors must coordinate with existing cyber regulation to avoid overlap and confusion in industry. Now, I think my time is gone. We will soon uh, come to the deliveries. We will uh, draft the cyber regulation for aviation. Uh, we're doing it right now, in fact, and we'll, we will launch a draft in the middle of next year. And we expect this European Center for Cyber Security and Aviation to be operational before the end of next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Just grab the microphone before I bring everyone forward. I think, is it there or did I take it with me? Just grab that mic. Yes, a quick, a quick question because I think it's uh, useful. And there. Remy won't want you there, he needs you here, the mysterious Remy. Um, first of all, I like that quote, and possibly that's some, a quote that somebody will tweet, a ma malicious alignment of all the weak points in our systems. So that is presumably at the heart of what you called a systemic approach. Any sector needs a systemic approach because of this potential malicious alignment. Is that what I, did I correctly well, that's, grasp? That's correct. And in the aviation system, uh, we are not stronger than the weakest link in the system. Sure. So uh, a cyber, could, uh, a cyber uh, uh, attacker could enter in, into a maintenance workshop and right. put a, a malicious software there and it will enter the whole system. Okay, hence you saying we need this whole end to end from the apps end to end so that there is a common risk, uh, a common risk management approach. One quick, perhaps slightly off the wall question. Yesterday I did the future and emerging technologies uh, side event and I met two guys in the bar in the hotel, sorry that sounded wrong. Two gentlemen who had been in that session approached me afterwards to have a chat who were working on the Human Brain Project. And they said, wow, Katrina, you wouldn't believe the questions we get from the general public around, you've taken over my brain, what are you doing? And the, quick question, because planes, security, it's right up there with people. Do you sense that there is an increasing fear among people that they're making this link between Digital domain, planes, uh, risks, different kind of risks than just, are you seeing this? What we sense right now is that people are mostly thinking about the physical security and, okay. and the stories we have there, where the cyber uh, attacks are still kind of, well, not out in the open. Uh, people hear when things are breaking down and not functioning, but I don't think that so many are yet connecting it to the safety dimension when you're actually flying. Okay, all right, so it's a bit different. It's a little bit different than in the other sectors that we've spoken about in terms of citizen, consumer, user awareness. I think so, but, but I, I think as well that people have uh, an expectation that when they're flying, they're flying safe, whatever the 
a problem could be, whether it could be a cyber security attack or a traditional safety problem. And also, of course, if you just have the issue with the smartphone, was it Samsung version when, you know, you, there was always the announcement made fairly recently, if anyone's got that phone, for God's sake, don't switch it on. So it's those kinds of stories that are really resonating, I think, with the general public. So I will take that. What I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, or perhaps I don't know if I'm going to hear, is there stuff on Slido? Someone give me a thumbs up. Vasily, there is. Right, so I'm going to come with me, sir. We're going to go over to this bit. Can I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to kindly grab your microphones and sit here because my eyesight isn't good enough to read Slido from back there. We're going to sit like little birds on a wire here and we're going to go straight into this so that we can give... There we go. Who needs a mic? Sit. Sit tight together. We look like a larger version of ABBA, I think. Look, we're all going to... I should have sort of thought of, I don't know, an Austrian band, but I don't know any Austrian bands. OK, it's a bit difficult. Is there any way we can remove the timer, since I know how much time we have, because we can't read the top question? Per, so, Kai, have a, take a moment, ladies and gentlemen, to have a look at what we've got. Have we got them there? We have, so our audience can see. Why are these apps and these companies being allowed to track and process? Why? Is it different? Yeah, we're doing this comparison. We're talking about the US, talking about China, Japan, Europe. How can we protect our privacy from foreign secret services? How can we assure cybersecurity if most of our digital and network devices come from outside the EU? That's interesting as well, because indeed, we are importing the protection, aren't we? The majority of the protection is being imported into the EU, the products and the services. Uh, Kai, do you want to start us off? I can do, I can try and, and very, very, very to. Good, very very good microphone. question. Very yep. good question. And I think the main reason is because when you click to download the app, usually you click down and you click agree to quite a long things of conditions, and then you basically have allowed to, to this to happen. And that is regardless of whether in Europe or in the US, you yourself have decided to allow it. And the bigger problem behind it is, of course, have you ever read the terms and conditions before you clicked to download an app? And the answer is no. And I hope that based on, for example, the GDPR and the hopefully upcoming e-privacy regulation, we will have situations where we can say certain things in the app market need to be declared so clearly to you that, hey, you're saying yes to something which is maybe not what you wanted, and that then actually you can, um, you can check and make a decision. And of course, the other element is you need to be able to make an, and to have choice. I mean, when you have the yes and no, and then whatever your have to use this app, for example, to go to this conference, so there's no other option, then we need to have something else there. And again, that could be the difference between European and elsewhere legislation, allowing people to have a choice here. Okay. And interestingly, the difficulty I find is that when you give people the information and then they have to say yay or nay, the point is I know me. We live in this accelerated world where we go, oh, yeah, whatever. So now, you know, even with all the GDPR and you're using cookies, do you want to do this? Is this okay with that? Yes, yes, yes. So it's, a, it's, it's very, very tricky. Oh, I would add to this. Uh, in my, from my perspective, the flashlight example is sort of tip of the iceberg in the sense that, yeah, it's a stark example where things like that would actually help. That is, you would clearly somehow question whether a flashlight app needs location data, et cetera. But there are many, many apps. For example, the whole Google ecosystem as, as is now, I think, heavily discussed in the EU, which, for example, Google Maps, of course, do have legitimate use for location data, but at the same time, whether that same data can be used for other purposes, that is, for monetizing the data. And I think that's a bigger question that you can't really solve by changing the policy or the, the way the operating system sort of communicates to the customer. One, well, I think you can do two things. You can change something in the policies by saying certain things are needed or not needed. And again, when we look into Google Maps, certain data may need to be transferred to localize you and, and, and help you to navigate. But there's quite a few other ones that would not need to be transferred. And then I agree, the other side of the medal is how are these data being used and do I as a user have a hand on it and have an influence on it? And again, that is partly a policy question, but it's partly a technology question because when you, for example, I was at the European Parliament where there was e-privacy directive being discussed. Mm -hmm. And then you see companies like Google coming up and say, hey, we do need this. 
and we, we really need these data. And then you look at the scenario and say, hey, no, you don't need these data if you build your technology differently. So it is a very close inter interaction between technology and business case that needs to be discussed in much more detail that's, in future. That's a very nice quote. It is a very close relationship between technology and business case, which needs a lot of discussion. Thank you. I'm asking you guys to be nice and punchy. And uh, you, are, you speak even faster than me. That's impressive in my own language. So, Stephanie, I think you said that you could make uh, some comments on the, f the first couple of questions that came in. Yeah, so also the first is a great question. So how can we in Europe protect our privacy from foreign secret services? So security and privacy, of course, uh, depends on the security and privacy of the whole system. But especially if you're worried about nation states, uh, quantum security is, of course, the sort of ultimate security that you can attain. Uh, and if anyone would have uh, the first sort of quantum computer to actually use to break your classical encryption, then probably it will be something like the NSA. And did you want to, or...? Yeah, so the, there's also a second question that's sort of related to that. Um, namely, how can we assure cybersecurity if everything that we buy is... We buy it internationally. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there's two answers to this. Uh, one of them is a, is a very practical one in the sense that maybe we should make more devices in Europe. <laughs> and the second one is sort of a technical one where also quantum can help. In fact, um, uh, in quantum you can to some extent in fact mitigate this effect in the sense that at least if you know that your sort of classical test algorithm is correctly implemented, which are easy to implement, which you might you want you to do yourself, you can actually run certain statistical tests on quantum uh, security devices that can ensure you that they're secure, um, even if, in fact, you don't have characterized the device and you don't quite know exactly what's going on inside. So this is known as device-independent security in quantum. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, please, do. And then I'm going to ask for a, a last word from you, you sir, and you, um, lovely lady for the finance sector, if there's anything you didn't get to say or a key takeaway. But let me hear from you first, Dr. Anand. All right, thanks. So uh, the second question there about the certification and things like that, that actually touches quite a bit of political side and yep. technical side. Um, when the signaling, that's sort of, that was a word being used before communication back uh, during the First World War even, uh, people were saying things should be in one country. Yeah? It should be, it should, Communication things should, communication devices should not, or technology should not be developed outside. Now we are not in that world. Uh, even if you develop in Europe, you don't know where the software is coming yeah. from. Yeah. So uh, what uh, we ha and well, UK ha made its choice of how to do things. Uh, that could be a good way to do, uh, good good example to proceed. Um, technically. Um, we in 3GPP have specifications for tech security testing. We call it security assurance solutions, uh, specifications, SCUS. GSMA has a, it's a whole uh, framework of how labs should be certified and testing should happen. And probably this, this could be one way, and then each company, each organization, each vertical can set up their requirements as well. In short, there's much more behind that. Okay, and just so to, to this whole, sorry, so I should come, this, this whole issue, because I think that's interesting, this one, IoT, any device that's too cheap to maintain security in, does anybody want to, I think that's an interesting, uh, if we're looking at the number of devices that are connected, is that something that you could come back on? Right, well, the question is whether it's a bad idea for, whether IoT by itself is a bad idea, I think it's a pull from the market, right, so it's not like the sort of uh, the vendors are coming up necessarily with these ideas themselves. They see the trends in the market and somehow follow. Uh, so there's some, uh, undoubtedly, some demand from, from, the, from the customer base. Uh, now the question is whether it is actually being overheated. That is, you know, when we talk about appliances, for example, or all those you know, smart home devices, whether we are kind of maybe ahead or the, the, the device vendors are trying to be slightly ahead of the curve too much in terms of first kind of not focusing on the, the real issues such as security and then only then putting out the, the products in the market. But I think uh, an IoT as a trend, as a sort of change in the ecosystem is sort of unstoppable at this stage. I don't think there's anything that can be done about that. Just, just one sentence to that. Uh, I think business-wise, we'll require all these devices. It will happen. Uh, price is important. And uh, I say that Sense is a way to move ahead. Security as a network service, we can provision solutions in the 5G era, especially uh, from the network side. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, please. Well, um, I understand that the, um, the cybersecurity certification framework that is now under discussion aims to deal with issues like that, so to create some kind of baseline security for mass consumption devices. However, until that happens, and of course even if that happens, it's not 100% secure, nothing is 100% secure uh, on the digital world, that's how, why awareness uh, plays a key role. So in my opinion, we should ask ourselves, counting the risk over the benefit, so is it that important to connect your washing machine if you know that this device can be easily hacked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm going to round up. I will, coming to you, Jasper, just to say, for this question on the cybersex skills, tune in. I will make sure that it gets asked in the session, the first one tomorrow, okay? Because we're looking at digital skills as a whole. So we can treat that one in that session. Jasper, any... Your last word, please. Yes, uh, uh, with my experience from, from aviation, I think it's very important that we, we actually give the responsibility to the various industries. You have to take care of our cybersecurity. Uh, it is uh, not only, we do it in energy consumption, we do it in, 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 in uh, consumer safety, and so why not in cyber? So, That's it. We, I, like, like in aviation, I think most other industries, they must be responsible for the cybersecurity, also for the users and the consumers using, like, like we do in, in, in safety and energy and in, in a lot of other uh, domains. Yes, but uh, honestly, that works last for... Last one sentence. Go for it. Last yeah, sentence. That, that works for the big industries, like in aerospace, ships, and all of that. But for the toy industry and for many of the household industry, it does not work because the margins are too small, the business are too small, the software engineering skill is too small. One, one thing for taking home, if you want to look about Internet of Things for your toys, look at the Norwegian uh, Consumer Agency's website. The Norwegian Consumer Ma Agency's website. website, okay. They have wonderful reports on how Internet of Things toys yeah. are tested, and you, will, you may want to look at that before you buy your Christmas toys. Oh, okay. Okay, who's done all their Christmas shopping already? Hands up. Great, then, oh, well, too late. <clears throat> Maybe don't look at the report, okay? So, I'm sorry we have to park it. These good people are around. Seriously, grab them if you have questions, okay? Grab the commission if you have further questions. You can find them, you can email them. Can we first of all give a huge round of applause to these very good, brainy people? Thank you so very much. Okay, so uh, you've got coffee time, 11.30. You've got one of two parallel sessions, Key Digital Technologies for the Future of Europe. I think that is in here. I believe that's in here. Or Blockchain, okay? That's in Hall C, Level 2. Then you've got a 90-minute lunch, and then we've got a plenary session in here that starts at 2.30, Beyond the Internet, Next Gen Internet. Do tweet, something erudite always helps. And don't forget tonight, first come, first serve, there is potentially reception for you. Um, at City Hall in Vienna, but you need to go to the Austrians downstairs if you want to get a ticket. Thank you very much. See you again. And thank you to those of you at home, sorry, who are still with us.